but just welcome you on behalf of the hub and to say that uh, we're recording the meeting for for other people to be able to watch it afterwards um, and that very this is very much in the spirit of an informal gathering uh, to start to build our um, our work and our our plans on housing first and women our next part i'll hand over to amanda to introduce our keynote presentation we'll follow that by uh, with some questions and discussion and then we have a, a few topics that we wanted to bring up in sort of a small group work setting if we have time. We'll do our best to, to, to make sure we don't run over time, but also to give everyone a chance to sort of uh, exchange and, and talk with each other as well. Um, so I think that's that's it for me at this stage. So I'll hand over to Amanda. Hi, hi everyone. Um, just, just really to introduce um, Louisa, Rhiannon and Michaela. They come from an organisation in England and they're delivering housing first, stop me if I get this wrong guys, but they're delivering um, housing first um, for women in particular fleeing DV. And I think it's a, quite an innovative approach. Um, I think we know in women's services quite often DV and homelessness become hand, come hand in hand um, and this approach that they've got that is um, <clears throat> quite innovative approach and they're going to do a talk for us about that and tell us all about what they're doing why they're doing it and how how they've how they've got there so just to introduce um the three people from um standing together and women's solace solace women solace women's aid sorry rihanna <laughs> solace women's aid yeah yeah so yeah well, thanks so much for coming we're really um interested to hear what's happening in your project thank you hi everyone so um uh, myself, Rhiannon and, and Michaela are going to talk about um, developing housing first for women experiencing all domestic abuse, but kind of all forms of violence against women and girls kind of under that umbrella. Um, so just a little bit. So my name's Louisa. I'm, I'm the housing first and homeless manager at Standing Together. Um, uh, Standing Together are based in West London. Um, we were founded 20 years ago uh, with the ambition to eradicate domestic abuse um, by transforming the way organisations and individuals think about, prevent and respond to it. We operate across various settings, including health, housing, criminal justice and communities. Um, we work on something called the Coordinated Community Response to Domestic Abuse, um, uh, which is basically getting all the local agencies in a local area working together in a coordinated way to tackle domestic abuse um, and improve understanding and response to survivors and perpetrators. So I work specifically on the Housing First and Homelessness Project. Uh, that's been going since like 2017. Um, uh, and we really work on strengthening and building partnerships across the homelessness and violence against women and girls sectors. Um, so um, yeah, that's a little bit about standing together. Uh, Rhiannon and Michaela, do you want to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about Solace? Yeah. Um, hello, I'm Rhiannon. I think I wanted to introduce myself um, earlier. I'm the team manager at Housing First at Solace Women's Aid. So Solace is one of the uh, largest charities, I think, in the UK now for um, uh, supporting women and men with um, survivors of violence against women and girls. And we have um, community-based services. We have, like... Um, uh, info services which I'll explain more about later, uh, refuges and uh, move on accommodation, we've got um, uh, helplines, therapeutic services and specialist provision for children and young people and we also have a multiple disadvantage section which is uh, includes housing first and also other projects for women um, who we class as multiple disadvantage or uh, complex needs it might be called as well. Cheers Rihanna. I'll pass on to Michaela. Hi, I'm Michaela and I'm a Housing First project worker with Solace Women's Aid. So I key work a few of um, the women that we caseload in the service. Thanks, Michaela. Right, um, so um, before I introduce the project, um, just thinking about why do we have to think about Housing First for Women? Um, and I know um, uh, Amanda talked um, a little bit about this um, in the last meeting back in April. Um, I'm going to probably say quite similar things, um, uh, but it's definitely worth repeating. Um, so uh, we know that um, uh, women who experience chronic or long term homelessness, so women who'd be eligible for that housing first cohort have very different needs to their male counterparts. Um, uh, I suppose one of the most uh, 
prevalent of those is experience of domestic violence and abuse. Um, so uh, uh, some uh, research on women and rough sleeping um, uh, in England showed that experience of domestic violence and abuse is near universal uh, among women who become homeless. Um, uh, also, um, in uh, definitely in England, um, women with multiple disadvantage, so that's uh, multiple disadvantages, women experiencing domestic abuse, but also substance misuse, issues with their mental health, um, maybe uh, they have uh, involvement with the criminal justice system as well, so how all of these things are experienced at the same time, um, and this excludes them quite often from mainstream services, so um, women struggle in homelessness services which are mainstream homelessness services, but that basically means they are designed around the needs of men um, who are um, uh, predominantly, they are um, the ones seen sleeping rough, et cetera. Um, so services have predominantly been designed around the needs of men. Um, uh, also um, women struggle to access this group of women struggle to access specialist domestic abuse services as well. So, for example, in England, um, trying to get a women's refuge, so a women's domestic abuse refu refuge space um, uh, for this particular group of women is very difficult. Um, there are very few of them. Um, there's evidence that showed that shows that this particular group of women potentially have higher needs than their male counterparts. And some of that comes from um, Amanda used to uh, manage the Threshold Housing First service. Um, and in their two year evaluation, um, they, um, uh, they kind of suggested that the women offenders had higher needs than the average male Housing First cohort in that project. Obviously we can't conclude this is the case for all, but there is evidence to suggest this is the case. And when we think about um, you know, the greatest disadvantage is experienced by those who endure a range of abuse across their lifetime. Um, and some research uh, recently done in England found that over 80% of this group are women. So experiences of violence and abuse are incredibly pertinent. Um, so that means a robust housing first response to women must prioritise the management of domestic abuse and other forms of violence against women and girls um, as well. Um, housing first services need to understand this difference um, and, and make those necessary kind of operational adjustments, I think. Uh, we also know that women are likely um, uh, to be hidden homeless, so not be picked up. Um, in rough sleeping counts and be in a number of kind of unsafe, informal um, housing situations um, to kind of get by. So it really is about, um, you know, having to look harder for this cohort of women as well. So a little bit about the project. So um, the project is commissioned by Westminster City Council. So Westminster is uh, with Camden, uh, it's one of the boroughs, local authorities in London that has the highest rates of rough sleeping. Um, uh, the project is funded by the uh, Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. Um, so Standing Together, which is the organisation I work for, it's very much, this project is very much a partnership project. So we did the kind of initial development of the project. Um, we kind of built relationships with housing providers um, who provide um, units, who provide housing for the scheme, and we maintain those relationships overseeing nominations, etc. cetera, um, uh, and we evaluate the project. Um, the housing is provided by uh, five um, housing associations, um, and the support is delivered, of course, by my wonderful colleagues at, at Solace Women's Aid. Um, and Solace are, as Rhiannon said, a specialist violence against women and girls provider, and it's this is a great project because I think this is the first project definitely in England where the support has been delivered by a specialist women's organization that usually sits within the homelessness sector. Um, okay, I'm going to pass on to Michaela. Thank you. So in terms of referrals, our service delivery commenced in August 2019 when we were supporting 11 women. Capacity was then expanded to 21 women in September of last year. The first cohort we had was 11 women and they were referred into the service by homelessness support services and 10 of the women were actually rough sleeping at the point of referral and referred in by outreach teams. 
The second cohort of 13 women were referred into the service by homelessness and women specialist services. Two of the women were sofa surfing at the point of referral. One was living in temporary COVID hotel accommodation and the remaining were actually referred in by supported accommodation or outreach teams within the borough. So all the women that we work with have experienced homelessness, such as rough sleeping, supported accommodation and sofa surfing. They've also experienced one or multiple forms of org violence against women and girls, such as domestic abuse, sexual violence and sexual exploitation, in addition to substance use and poor mental health. So 14 of the women with Housing First have had children unfortunately removed from their care, and 10 of the women have had offending histories. This is me. Thanks, Michaela. Um, yeah, so as Michaela mentioned, we've, you know, we've supported the project has been expanding and we've just found out we're expanding again to support um, uh, more women. Um, so as, you know, uh, uh, Louisa mentioned that Westminster has one of the highest, uh, her, highest area of rough sleeping in the UK. Um, and it's estimated that around 50 women uh, sleep rough every year. However, this is likely to be underestimate because of the invisibility of women's homelessness and um, chain, um, the verification system that is used in London, they don't uh, verify women who are sleeping on buses, for example. So just to talk about uh, how we provide our support. So we're, um, a of, we're primarily a domestic abuse charity, uh, domestic, uh, domestic abuse and other forms of violence against women and girls. Um, so we are all trained in VORG and we um, offer IDVA support. Most of our women are high risk um, IDVA. Uh, so in that case, IDVA support um, with women who are deemed a high risk of homicide. Um, and we work with them um, quickly to reduce risk and um, find safety. We do offer practical and emotional support um, as well as much as Housing First is um and setting up and maintaining the tenancy accessing health services um setting up bank accounts applying for benefits and accessing activities we work in partnership with um different agencies and act as a single point of contact um reducing the risk of the service use being overwhelmed decreasing agencies working isolation and duplicating work So um, from the uh, pilot project, we had eight out of nine women who offer tenancy is able to maintain them. Um, all of these women were sleeping, were rough sleeping for many years and had previously abandoned or struggled in supported accommodation. Um, this includes, you know, the first two women who were housed in November 2019 who've been able to maintain their tenancies for over a year now. And this is their first time living in independent accommodation. Um, so we have nine women who have been engaging, um, uh, engaging well with their housing first workers and built a trusting relationship. And this is after many years of not engaging with services or being classed as difficult to engage. Um, eight women were supported to access drug and alcohol services. Two women accessed psychological support and many registered for GPs. Ten women made disclosures of Borg to the housing first worker and spoke about experiences that they had never disclosed before and many were supported to report to the police. And two women who were formerly rough sleeping for many years and now settled in the tenancies and were accepted into college recently. And seven women were supported to pursue their interests, including animal care and art. Okay, now on to Michaela. Thank you. So the first client we moved in has actually maintained her tenancy since November 2019, and she's really doing well. She's achieved a lot during this time. For example, she was initially rough sleeping, living on the streets and not really engaging much of any outreach teams following traumatic experiences and past hotel accommodation. However, this client was supported to set up benefits, open a bank account, get registered with a GP and get on script within a month for a property offer. This client is now maintaining her script, not using on top of her script and has reconnected and been on holiday with her family. She's got a passport and she now takes part in yoga exercise. So she's you know, living a much higher quality of life than before. Many of our clients are engaging in building trusting relationships with their key workers after many years of being lab labelled as difficult to engage, as Rhiannon mentioned. For example, one client has built up a really good relationship with their key worker and has even started to reach out to access mental health support, when, which she hasn't done before, as a result of encouragement and engagement. 
Clients are also motivated to participate in activities such as trips to art galleries, bad to see cats and dogs home and, art co and college assessments, with one client having recently started working a job. Many clients are also improving awareness of domestic abuse and expressing interest in learning about healthy relationships. Much of our clients have also been through so much trauma in the past that they're used to the violence and they feel unable to protect themselves. However, we've really seen great improvements in raising their self-esteem so they feel able to disclose to us about the abuse, report to the police themselves and to engage in discussions with us about the power and control dynamics in abusive relationships. Thanks, Michaela. Um, so lots of amazing things there. Um, and you're doing this one as well, sorry. I am, yeah. <laughs> so we've also got a case study here from one of our service users. Um, we've changed her name to protect her identity and her anonymity. So Katie had experienced physical and emotional abuse from family members from a young age and throughout her life. She was groomed by an extremely abusive older man as a young teenager, um, and she had a child resulting from this abuse, but this child was then removed and actually placed in his custody, the perpetrator's custody. Um, so traumatic experiences of this past abuse led to her to misuse substances and use drugs, and she has also had several abusive partners since then. So at the time of referral, she was heavily using crack cocaine and heroin, and she was rough sleeping with her dog around the central London area. And she'd been doing this for at least the last two years since we initially met her. And after meeting her housing first worker, Katie was supported to access independent accommodation, and she was able to furnish her flat how she liked it and make her home her home. Um, a few months later, Katie was clean and she was no longer using. She was facilitating recovery groups and accessing psychological support. She had recently been accepted for a counselling course as well at college to work towards her long-term goal of being a counsellor, which is a really great outcome for her. And she's really happy with that. Um, Katie still has visits from a housing first worker weekly who's supporting her with domestic abuse from her current partner, because unfortunately that abuse is still ongoing. And this ongoing support for her is really crucial to increase her safety and minimise the risk with the client, especially during working with her and loan working. But when we asked Katie for feedback on our housing first project, Katie told us to make sure that rough sleepers can access accommodation that allows dogs because she feels that they are really a great support support for her and to get through hard times. Um, so this was really good feedback that we received and we were really, really pleased with that. Cheers, Michaela. Um, yeah, that's a fantastic outcome there for that woman. Um, so just a little bit about the housing, because that's Standing Together's role, really. Um, so we um, set up um, a kind of a coalition of housing providers um, who offer properties outside of their social housing, local authority allocations. Um, because the um, service originally started as a small pilot of, of 10 women, it was quite, it was easy, well, easier to get housing providers and just say, oh, we need three properties or two. So, you know, these are big housing providers and, you know, a small ask. Um, so that's how we did it. And we've still got those housing providers on board. Um, uh, we maintain them. So we kind of oversee the nominations um, process. So how um, the workers at Solace nominate women for properties. And we monitor the offers that the housing providers give. Um, we kind of liaise between the housing provider and the Solace um, uh, workers. Um, so when there are problems, when issues arise, um, uh, either via email or in meetings. Um, so this includes both the lettings process and tenancy issues. Um, we also um, coordinate uh, quarterly partnership meetings uh, well, every four months. So between all the registered providers and the SOLIS team. So we all meet together, all of the providers meet together and the SOLIS team. So it's very much a partnership approach from all of our housing providers, SOLIS and us at Standing Together, um, uh, which is great. Um, so just quickly, um, uh, because Standing Together evaluated, so we've got the one year evaluation, which is um, uh, monitors the progress of that initial cohort of 10 women. Um, now, um, what we found, so thinking about how Housing First for Women needs to be a little different, um, is we found that engaging women can potentially take longer and maybe it'd be a bit more difficult. So um, what we found is that pre-engagement work was absolutely important. So taking the time to build relationships um, with women, 
Um, so often um, we know women have experienced complex trauma and they take a long time to trust uh, workers. Um, they've experienced domestic abuse, other forms of violence against women and girls, other forms of trauma, layer upon layer upon layer. Um, so when they get to housing first, it does take time to build that relationship and you have to give it that time. Um, so the housing first model gives women that time and a worker that won't lead them and tell them what to do but stand by their side. Um, and this relationship building period is absolutely key. Um, so also um, we have a maximum caseload of five women to one worker. So in, in England, the guidance is five to seven, um, but we think definitely five due to the complexity um, uh, of, of um, you know, the women's lives and experiences um, uh, when they start engaging, when they're referred into the project. Um, uh, and good relationships with the referrer. So um, the service has built up some fantastic relationships with homelessness um, and other women specialist providers um, in uh, the area. Um, and uh, that's worked really well because it's not like the referrer doesn't drop the referral into the service and disappear. So it's a bit more of a kind of staged handover, uh, which I think is really important. Um, Obviously, managing domestic abuse and violence against women and girls is absolutely crucial. Um, it is the key thing for any housing first working with women, I think. Um, and that's why it's amazing that we've got Solace Women's Aid, who are a specialist women provider doing support. Um, so it really is about supporting women who remain in relationships with perpetrators. As the case study said, Katie is still in a relationship um, with an abusive partner. Um, and that's not uncommon. And that's realistic um, and it's about mitigating risk so thinking about how you can mitigate risk around that it's not telling women that they have to be separated from their partners um, you know um, uh, but they solace have done amazing work um, as Rhiannon and Michaela have said around building awareness around domestic abuse and around those power and control dynamics and helping women get to that point where they might want to start thinking and making other choices about that relationship um, they also um, do work in terms of linking perpetrators in with support, because if you are supporting a, uh, a woman who's in a relationship with a perpetrator, um, you have to also make sure that you, that perpetrator is linked in with has a worker um, or has someone supporting them. And we find that if you do that, it mitigates risk for the women. So it's safer to make sure that the perpetrator is being worked with as well. Um, uh, definitely helps in terms of um, uh, improving that woman's safety. Um, and also SOLIS um, have the ability to do adapted risk assessment and safety planning. So um, I think uh, Rihanna mentioned the term IDVA earlier. So IDVAs in uh, this country are independent domestic violence um, advisors, um, and they are basically specialist domestic abuse advocates. Um, so um, Rhiannon um, and Michaela work like in this way, in this specialist domestic abuse advocate way, but they've adapted their processes to work better for women with multiple issues and multiple needs. Um, we also know that it's really important to support women as mothers, as we said, so 10 of the women have had children removed into care um, uh, or with family members um, or adopted. Um, so um, the, the project's done some great work in terms of reconnecting women with family members and supporting women to have what we call letterbox contact, so be able to kind of have send letters um, to children in care. Um, housing as well. So in terms of our relationships with the housing providers, it, it works fantastically well. We're incredibly lucky um, uh, because our relationships with them, um, we've been able to train them um, so they understand the needs of the women on the project. Um, and they really make sure they match the needs of the woman to the property. Um, so if she's got ongoing uh, domestic abuse and there's a perpetrator about, um, it's about thinking, would she be safe? for in a big block of flats or would an on-street property be um, more suitable? Um, so it really is about kind of matching that up and making it work. And I think because we've got good relationships with our housing providers, it, yeah, it's, it's just been 
it's been a lot easier. Um, and very quickly, just in terms of barriers to scaling up, because there are a few in England. So obviously, the, it's the same with Housing First Anywhere, need for longer term funding, um, especially because engaging women with complex trauma and domestic abuse takes a long time. Um, uh, so, you know, really needing that kind of more long term funding. Women are hidden homeless. There's a real danger of focusing housing first on just the visible rough sleeping cohorts. Um, uh, it is about it. So with the, the services expanding again um, uh, this summer, and we're thinking about how we can um, get referrals from other services who might be working with women who are less known to outreach services. So reaching some more of those hidden, hidden homeless women. Um, Housing First for Women, a gender informed approach needs to be integrated into mixed and generic services as well. Specialist Women's Housing First services are so amazing um, and they have a lot of specialist knowledge, um, but we also need to be thinking about our mixed services as well and implementing a gender informed approach within that. Um, and obviously funding for Housing First should take gender into account. A one size fits all approach just isn't gonna work for women. So it is thinking about how we can integrate that. And that's it. So thank you very much. And there's all our details. We're happy to send you the slides as well. Thanks, guys. The questions in the chat. We have some time. Uh, there was a question for Louisa. Louisa, if uh, will you be able to share the latest evaluation report? Absolutely. It's yeah. being okay. designed. I'm making it look pretty at the moment. <laughs> when it's pretty, I'll share it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Louisa. That's very important that it's pretty if we, yeah, if we talk about women's homelessness for sure. Um, um, question, then Gert is asking on domestic violence. We give a house to a woman with child who has fled from a violence, violence situation, but after two weeks there was another man who was also living in this house and there was again a situation of violence. How could we do better next time? Yeah, it's a, a, a key yeah. situation from uh, from one of the projects of Housing First. So yeah. it's uh, and very uh, interesting to see how you manage to have such a good uh, uh, contacts with the housing housing provider because here in Belgium that's really a problem for us. So they are very uh, critical to what we are doing and from the moment there are problems they say you see those people can't live uh, independently you see there are problems the neighbors are very um, um, fixed on it so from the moment there are problems from the moment there are fights in the streets it's always our clients who have done it so uh, in this case it was also someone we we uh, argumented that this woman with the child was from a very problematic situation so she could uh, flat from her man and live independently and after two weeks there was another man living uh, in uh, who had already made papers uh, in the community so had the right to stay in the house so it was not easy to uh, uh, let them let them go. So it's a question. I see the response. I can um, imagine that it will work for another house, but it's not that we have three or four houses at the moment who are free, so we can skip uh, to the next house. So it's uh, housing first is very on um, giving choice and control to people and let people uh, decide for themselves. But what if? people in this case make decisions that are um, not as good as we think that are. I'm, I'm choosing my words. Uh, yeah, it's it's really, that's a really good point. And I think Rhiannon's response is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna say the same thing, but like, um, it can be very difficult, especially when women are making choices, but they're making choices within the sphere of that perpetrator's control. Um, so it's, it can be incredibly difficult. I think what we try to do, um, and I think it, we are lucky because we've got these relationships with our housing providers and we have been in and done workshops with the housing officers about domestic abuse, about the women's needs, just increasing that understanding um so if um a, whim, a woman is 
evicted or a tenancy breaks down because of domestic abuse, then there's got to be scope to move her to another one if that's what she wants. Um, so it's not that she'll be, you know, evicted and out of the project from that point. It's there's got to be scope to move, um, move her on. And I know not in this service, but I know in another service in London, a woman who's been moved four times um, uh, because either the perpetrator has found her again or she's got into a relationship with a new perpetrator. But there's got to be that uh, ability to, 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 to move somebody on um, and obviously have other conversations about other uh, support options that might be available. But yeah, it, it is incredibly difficult um, to manage. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, definitely. I think just to uh, follow on from that, I think we've had similar situations when, you know, you feel like you're, you know, the person is just making the choice that is putting them at, at risk of homicide, essentially, and it's just going to be so difficult to make sure that they're safe. I think if we didn't have that relationship with the house providers, if they were in, um, if we didn't have that, you know, that relationship, then there would be a, a risk of these clients getting evicted for antisocial behaviour because um, because of the domestic abuse. And that's where we have to come in and say, OK, this is not the result of their actions. This is the perpetrator's actions or whoever what's going on. This is like defensive violence or um, that kind of thing. So we that that well, what you just said is key, really, the relationship with them. So we and from then we've been able to find like innovative solutions for safety. So in one case we had um, like we had to do well, we had to get the police to go around to do welfare checks for a client we felt, you know, it is at high risk of uh, domestic abuse. And um, the police kept breaking her door down and then they having to repair the door over time. So the house provider helped us provide a uh, key safe outside the door. So we could, um, the police could come in and just take the keys and, and just check on her safety that way. So she was happy. We were happy, obviously, because we found that she was uh, OK. And, and in addition of the getting, you know, keep keep reiterating the stories like we've got safety measures, we can help you with getting orders against him. You can help you with, like, keep reporting to police, all that kind of thing, the usual, usual kind of stuff. So that's just one example. Thanks very much. Uh, Amanda, mm -hmm. is it OK if I let uh, Matilda and Pierre yeah, 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 no, mine's like the last one anyway, so don't worry. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's what I was thinking. Okay, uh, Matilde, you're welcome. Uh, thanks. Um, so I have a question, I guess, for Rihanna, maybe since you presented the slide, you said that 87.5% of women were able to sustain tenancy. Uh, what were the specific reasons why Housing First didn't work out for the rest, for the 12.5%? If you were, good. If able to. yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, we had. I think it was just one client that we to account for. Um, who, yeah, unfortunately, her tenancy broke down. Long story, um, short, but um, it was a result of she antisocial behaviour towards the neighbours. Um, so they had to, like, we negotiated a long time. We are linked in with community safety teams in the area, we linked in with, like, we had a good relationship with housing providers who were able to support her as much as possible. But unfortunately, the behavior continue is becoming a detriment to um, the neighbors. So um, they had no choice but to put a closure order on the property. Um, but that's the only, uh, this only tenant. Um, there hasn't you know there's only a client that hasn't worked out for everybody else even we had one client who was um also since left the project she didn't want to have housing first support more so we've you know that's, that's okay choice and control along with housing first um but she's still maintaining her tenancy so um everywhere else it's they've been able to sustain it and pierre welcome yeah, I, I just uh, I had the same question for the person who has uh, lost tenancy. We, we does it happens very frequently, and so we just provide another housing. I mean, and we do it two. We can do it two or three times, and if we do it three times, then after that, maybe we ask ourselves some question about. Is this solution really adapted to the person? But before three times, I mean, 
it's perfectly it could be perfectly normal uh, this kind of uh, change we consider it uh, perfectly normal for people having experienced homelessness for a long time uh, what whatever the, the gender uh, we have had a lot of um, problems with women in housing first with abusers and it's not necessarily a story that starts in the street i mean you can have one person, one woman in the street, and then uh, you rehouse her, and then suddenly someone appears, and you never heard about this man, and maybe she didn't know him before in the street, or she knew him, but it was a kind of loose relation, or just a, a dealer, maybe a drug dealer. I mean, can be any kind of situation. And then suddenly he lives in the home with, with the women and not necessarily, they don't have necessarily a relation. I mean, but he, he's just there and he's, he's causing a lot of trouble. And that's, that's for me, that's the big problem. And we have have that uh, a lot of time. So I, I take notice of the, the, the fact that you should better try to have the, the perpetrator also uh, in some kind of follow-up, but it's not easy because these people normally they don't want to be followed. They they just uh, and they are some sometimes also violent uh, for us. So for us it's a big it's a big problem. We have also have women with uh, problems with family members in the sense of uh, we have one woman, she has three brothers and they come in her home and they have drug problems and they are violent. And so she asked us to change her home and uh, that their, her brothers not be aware of where she is. So what we see is that on the long term, you can have an effect on the woman and that she realized that she must not open the door. She must not give the key. And, and maybe she can go to the police to, to, uh, to, to ask to, to, how do you say that, to... to um, I mean, to, to deposit, uh, to say that there is a problem and that the police could, could act at, in some way. But it's a long process. It's possible. We have seen that it's possible, but it's a long and difficult pro process. And for our team, it's very difficult to see that. I mean, to see the situation, you, you have to deal with it because at certain moment, you cannot do everything you want. I mean, and even if you call the police, if there is an abuse, they come, they see, and then they not necessarily are able to do something at the, the right point. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult question indeed. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, did you want to comment, Rhiannon or Luisa or Mikaela? Anything? No, um, Han, go later. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is, it is difficult. And I think what you say is right, Pierre, it is just about, it does take a long time. Um, it does take a long time. Um, I think, um, I think, I think what has been useful about this project, because I've worked in a mixed housing first, pro mixed gender housing first projects as well in London. And I think what is useful about this project is that Rhiannon and Michaela and the rest of the team um, are all kind of trained around all different aspects of violence against women and girls. So they're having conversations with women about relationships, not specifically about domestic abuse, um, but about relationships. Um, and by doing that, um, I think it helps. Again, it's a long thing, <laughs> but it does help to build awareness um uh of um kind of power and control dynamics and things that are going on and, and help the women and, and this is a long process but it does help them to get to that place in their brain where they're able to say actually i'm not going to let that person in today or i'm you know i'm not going to answer the door to that person today it's a long thing but i do definitely think that helps to be for the workers to feel confident to have those conversations around power and control dynamics um, and be, be super, super skilled and trained up around, not just domestic abuse, because as you say, we know women are vulnerable to a wide range of violence. So exploitation from dealers, 
um, you know, um, they might be involved in survival or transactional sex to get money for drugs, um, you know, a, a, a real range of things going on um, as well. Um, so it's about kind of, yeah, being super skilled up on that, I think. I think that's definitely helped with this project. Um, but as you say, it's definitely a long, <laughs> it's a long process. Mm -hmm. How long is a piece of string? Yeah, that's why we need lo um, longer funding because I think with, yes. you know, women who, we're working with women who've been in domestic abuse relationships for over 30 years. Mm. And it's, you know, it takes a, such a long time to unpick all that and just like slowly, I think some of our women, I feel like the identity is kind of being subsumed by the perpetrator. So they just, and they have no realize that they don't, they don't recognize the violence. They've just been so traumatized. They don't recognize that this is like very unhealthy, you know, relationship. So it's just slowly, very slowly, just instilling that modeling, modeling that healthy behavior and um, just you know, helping them gain the confidence and self-esteem back very gradually, but it, it takes like, I mean, it will take years. I think we've been, we're still going with it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Susan, we give you time as well. Yeah, just ask a question. Then I know we are running a bit behind, but these are very interesting questions. So I think it's much more important to have this chat. Yeah, on you go, Susan. Thank you. Just it, it's, a question, but also just, you know, a couple of observations from what's been said and, you know, the, the, how essential it is to have that specialist support that Solas are able to provide from the, you know, where they are probably their kind of personal values come from as well and uh, the long term work that is required and having worked for a women's aid organisation for a long time, I know the other attitudes that are out there and that can make your work even more difficult and the recognition that as you say you know these are women that have had possibly lifetime experiences of trauma you know you're not going to undo that in a couple of weeks you know that that's you know a very very long-term sustained work thing and you know the fact that they, they they do unfortunately maybe move from one relationship where they're experiencing abuse to another which people can't get their heads around unless they understand, you know, the background to that woman's experiences and the perpetrator's behaviour. And that leads me to my question. How successful do you find the work with perpetrators is? And I ask this as somebody who is deeply cynical in this area, but um, how successful do you find that? How do you reach success? But anyway. I think I'm going to come in first. I think when I said the project links um, perpetrators in with support, I didn't mean like any, uh, well, I didn't mean like specialist support to address their perpetrating behaviour. Uh -huh. right. There's a big, so I mean like to, to, in order to safeguard the woman, it's important yeah. to make sure that the perpetrator's needs are being met. Like, are they on benefits? Have they got access to food? Like, practical kind of basic needs? Because sometimes that's not the case. So it's really yeah. important. And also, you know, maybe getting them uh, a homeless, an outreach worker or somebody who can um, key work them, provide them a bit of support. There's a big gap in England. Right. So we have perpetrator programs which um, support perpetrators to address their abusive behaviour. Um, but they're 26 weeks long. And they're too, in Scotland, yeah. Too structured. So yeah. any perpetrator with multiple issues would not be able to engage with a 26 yeah. week long perpetrator program. Yeah. I'm sorry, I misunderstood what you said earlier. And that yeah. actually being answered is actually very interesting in itself. But you yeah. know, it's something that I think tends to get overlooked, you know, is that. Domestic abuse is criminal behaviour, you know, and in Scotland we have what they like to term the gold kind of standard, you know, it's not just about the physical abuse, it's the psychological and emotional abuse, and that kind of gets to me a bit when I think this is this is crime, you know, anyway, but uh, that was very interesting, thank you for your response, thank you. Thank you. Now, Amanda, it's your time. 
finally. <laughs> but it's been great conversation for sure. I mean, it's been very interesting. Re really good, yeah. I really enjoyed the uh, presentation. <clears throat> One of the things I really enjoyed was the slide on um, key considerations. And I know that um, <clears throat> many people who are here today are thinking about setting up maybe a women's housing first. And what I wanted to ask you guys that um, standing together on Solace Women's Aid is what operational changes did you have to make from a, from a would you say from a standard housing first to a women's housing first? What, what were the operational changes? Did you have to change anything? And if you could give some advice to people who want to set up a women's housing first, is there anything that really stands out for you? What would that be? Thanks. So sorry, I know it's um, there were two, two questions in one there. I used, I used, my, I used my questions twice. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, I'd say the first one is making sure that all workers are trained up in domestic abuse as standard, but other forms of violence against women and girls. So thinking about domestic abuse, thinking about um, sexual exploitation and what we call here transactional or survival sex, um, uh, uh, you know, and sexual violence as well. I think that's absolutely key um, and obviously trauma too but thinking about how trauma is gendered as well so um, you know obviously all housing first services work to a, a fairly trauma-informed framework but specifically thinking about how trauma is gendered I think is important um, for housing first workers who are um, who are supporting women um, so that's in terms of like skills and qualities needed for workers. Um, in terms of operational changes, I don't know, Rhiannon, do you want to talk about like, because I know you've adapted yeah. what you normally do as an independent domestic violence advisor to kind of make it a better fit for the service? Yeah, because I guess we didn't have a, like a, um, a solace because we're a primarily a women's charity, although we, some services do support men as well who were survivors of violence. Um, you know, we didn't really have a, like a housing first to adapt um so but we like it's like the adaptation came from like our standard borg services like so idva services who primarily work with uh survivors for over a period of 12 weeks and they just like it's crisis work so they're just getting in like um orders and you know criminal procedures and um like housing and emergencies crisis um, crisis moves so, and they're typically the work is over the phone. And so our clients who, you know, as everyone knows, like housing first, you know, they don't have phones or they're hard to reach or in our cases, like um, perpetrators all have the phone. So it's really incredibly hard to speak to the women. And so we kind of like, we've flipped that, out, that model on its head and we like go out, you know, outreach and we like, we'd met, we met women while they were sleeping. And these women who were previously, some of them had previously linked in with Solace, but their cases were closed because of they could, they didn't answer the phone. And after like, so the usual policy is after three times, try to call, mm -hmm. the case is closed because of the overwhelming demand and capacity. I mean, there's about, 30 or 40 cases on every 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 adverse caseload for example and they're all high risk of um they're all high risk of homicide so um but we because we have housing first caseloads and we have like we keep, try to keep it to um five women because of women having you know as louise mentioned the higher need um we do you know we we have the capacity to be able to go out meet them on outreach and um you know see them and out and about the community and hopefully sometimes getting them away from the perpetrator that where it, the perpetrator work comes in where we are linking up with the service so they the perpetrator can meet uh, their worker at the same time as we meeting them um meeting our women that's that's the way we've we've managed to do it which is it's completely different to how yeah. solace services work normally yeah yeah and, and, and any advice to other organizations wanting to set something up what i know we've talked about your skills for your workers you would have you you change in your approach it would be the housing first because what you've described Ryan, is the housing first approach mm. isn't it? is there anything else that you think god people must do this 
know? I think thinking about safety planning as well um, yeah. and ad adapting. So you can't just use traditional domestic abuse safety planning um, for this group of clients. So you have to take your traditional domestic abuse approach and adapt it for the needs of women who've got other complex things going, going on. Um, and that's something also thinking about risk assessments and doing risk assessments around domestic abuse, um, but making that more accessible for the housing first female cohort um, who, who struggle to engage in a structured assessment. Um, so that's something that I think the team have done really well. Um, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, the, the five maximum caseload I'd say, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. because it's, you know, all, you know, we know, and it's not saying that men don't have complex problems and, you know, histories of lifetimes of trauma, because we know they absolutely do. Um, but women are more likely, statistically, to have experienced violence and abuse. Yeah. Um, so it really is about, you know, bearing that in mind and um, kind of making sure that, um, yeah, caseloads reflect that. Um, this uh, I think what you said about Louisa about the trauma like trauma informed approach as well because even if you're setting for housing first women like I know our project is one of the referral criteria is they have to have experienced some kind of org but really like it's coming from the assumption if you're going to set for housing first women it's like coming from the assumption that all women have experienced um, like violence against women like just uh, and even if they haven't it is better to have a trauma informed approach anyway i think that is you know inherent to housing first yeah. our approach you know it's called the housing first the violence against women and girls housing first um but really all most women in this cohort will have experienced some form of violence against women and girls as rihanna said so it could really be have a completely different name but um <laughs> we, we 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 stress the violence against women and girls because of the specialism of solace yeah yeah brilliant thank you yeah <laughs> Um, apologies, Mick, I have to go now. We have to run it for another meeting. But um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, is that the end of the pelvis? Is that the end of the questions? Yeah, I don't see, but uh, Samara, she's got a few points to point out. Yeah. So that what Dalma was saying before, etc. Yeah. On you go, Samara. Yeah, Bye. no, I just say thank you to Louisa, Michaela, and, and Rhiannon. And, and um, I hope we were going to take some time to sort of work in smaller groups but i think yeah it was better to spend more time just going into these deep questions i even had written down like some of the very same questions that got asked so i was delighted to hear them be asked and answered um and maybe we're, one of the things we're going to we wanted to suggest is that we'll have another meeting like this uh probably in september or october and so we'd be delighted if you could come back and just be if you have time to be part of this sort of group that we're building to sort of think through what's useful I mean that's my goal as the kind of coordinator of the hub is like what's useful for us as the hub to create and what's useful for you as a sort of network to start building together and like Amanda and and, and Pilvi and our colleague uh, colleague Charlotte from Berlin who just let me know that she's quite sick which is why she wasn't here today um, they're really kind of leading leading this work so I just try and come in from the hub with some stuff that I know is going on and what could we do to support but I think it's really exciting to see this dynamic building up so if we can continue to meet like this I think it could be really useful and and your experience in, in London is really very, very helpful for us. So I hope you wouldn't mind if we invite you for our next meeting. <laughs> Great. Um, then just because we really have only a few minutes left and I know we are all getting a bit zoomed up to here and probably hungry for, for lunch, those of us on, uh, on this side of the time zone. Um, but what I wanted to raise were just a couple of things that came up that Dalma would have raised herself, but are coming up over the summer. Um, she is working on collecting some examples of good practice of housing first and women. And so obviously she will be in touch <laughs> about, uh, about the, the Westminster example, but I just wanted to say that she'll also be working with Matilda a little bit on this topic. And so we were gonna hopefully reach out to you to maybe answer some questions or, or just have a, a question, even if it's about 
what you're planning to do. And I think that the, the Belgian example is a really interesting one to think about what's coming up and, and how you would shape a call for proposals on Housing First for Women. So I think that's a really interesting topic. So just to let you know that's happening and that we'll be in touch about that. And if you think of other examples that we may not know about, please drop us a line to let us know so we know who to go and talk to about that. Um, and the other thing that uh, Dalma is working on with, uh, with an intern, just a very short research project, a desk research project, is looking at how the homeless sector works with the domestic violence and domestic abuse sector uh, across Europe. So uh, it's just to try and do a mapping of that. So if you have any studies or contacts that you think would be useful for us to include in that, so that kind of intersection where where things work well or even where there have been some tensions or issues I think it would be really helpful for us if you could just drop that in in an email and send it along to us it would be great so that were the two things from Dalma um, and then the other thing I wanted to suggest that maybe we could uh, talk about in the fall is building on this presentation uh, I we did a webinar in the spring with um, our Canadian partners in Ontario from the Inter Ontario uh, Community of Practice on Housing First, and they had invited a presentation from the west coast of the US from Seattle, where it's a, a really, it seems to be a quite well established and evaluated project on Housing First for women, particularly women who are uh, victims of domestic violence. And I thought it would be interesting to maybe invite them to have a discussion with them as well to see you know, what they've developed in terms of the tools they've set up, the evaluation program they've set up. Um, uh, just hearing the presentation itself was really fascinating. And I've gone to their website a few times and it, it's got some really interesting things on it as well. So I wanted to suggest that maybe as something that we could do in the fall. And then from there, sort of think about what, what we as a hub would want to build or, or, or create. So, um, so I was gonna include that when we send out some notes from this meeting, I'll, I'll include the, the link to that um, video of the, the webinar and also their, their website, which has some really interesting things on it. So that's all I wanted to say <laughs> at this stage. Yeah, very um, inspiring, really great, great session today. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>